So welcome to our fifth session, everyone. And today we'll be talking about clinical scenarios. And this is going to be our first session. Ollie, do you want to pitch the yeah. disclaimer? Yeah, just um, so standard disclaimer that we've been pitching every week, but it's still important. All views expressed in this talk and the series overall are solely those of us, the presenters, and do not reflect those of the NHS nor our employing trusts. Now, this is a longer and more complex disclaimer than before. This is really important because in this session, we're going to be talking about managing medical conditions um, in a later part of the session. So the management guidelines that are presented are correct as of the most recent edition of Advanced Life Support, that's ALS from the Resource Council, and referenced with NICE CKS as well, so the NICE guidelines. However, the the medical management that's presented in this lecture is not a substitute for appropriate medical training and you should continue to work within your scope of practice. So basically the contents of this talk do not constitute medical advice. If you have a medical problem, you should speak to your own doctor. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name's Alex, uh, trained at UCL Medical School, now working as a junior doctor at Royal Free Hospital. Um, I am an honorary academic at UCL and my rotations are shown and career aspirations are ethnic neurology. Hi everyone again old news my name's Ollie I trained at Warwick I'm a current academic F2 working up in Newcastle uh, with the rotation shown I'm looking at careers in neurosurgery or interventional neuroradiology. I have to unmute my mic. I'm Aqua from University of Leicester, currently at Royal Surrey, um, but also have, similar to Alex, I'm an honorary academic with UCL, um, and my rotations are on screen right now. And similar to Alex again, I want to be an academic urologist. All right, as we've briefly introduced, the next two sessions will be based on the eight most commonly tested A to E scenarios and SFP interviews. Um, these are also applicable to your medical finals OSCE stations as well. And as we will explain shortly, the reason these are extremely important, especially for the SFP interview, um, aqua next slide, are that um, because you are having one fewer um, clinical rotation, when you reach CT1 or ST1, you are expected to be just as competent as your colleagues who have done one more clinical rotation than you. So the format of this session will be, uh, we'll be going through some scenarios in the session four scenarios, and we'll be relying on your input um, to make it as interactive as possible and in a enjoyable PDL style format. So we won't tell you upfront uh, what we'll be covering, but we'll be working through the cases one by one. So as I've just mentioned, there is a greater demand and emphasis uh, in the SFP interviews for your clinical competency which kind of means that you need to be above average compared to your peers at this stage when you're applying. Often there are two to three scenarios and you need to decide on who to see based on clinical priority. This will vary from um, academic units, academic units interviews, but if we base it on uh, London, for instance, which is the most um, popular um, application, you tend to have two to three scenarios. You need to assess and manage the patient's in turn and justify and defend your decisions at the same time. So the possible scenarios are obviously a clinically unwell patient. You could also have a clinically potentially unwell patient who has the potential to deteriorate. But also don't forget that there is also a potential ethical scenario. So a patient who, you know, um, has had uh, bad news poorly broken to them, they're upset, an angry patient, the relative of a patient who is um, upset about the management of the relative and so on. So those are other types of scenarios that you could be facing as well. The general rule of these um, scenarios, just like an A to E situation, is to do an A to E through um, each one. But also you need to do an A to E and decide what's going to kill the patient first. The emphasis is on you to be a safe, reliable junior doctor and in general, you need to run through the A to E format, so airways, breathing, circulation, disability, and everything else. You want to also evaluate new scores and clinical trends to help your judgments. 
Um, and based on ethical situations, they tend to be lower on your priority list, but don't forget to come back to them and explain what you're doing in the meantime. This is important for you to have your spiel um, memorized. And um, so a standard one is shown here is, I would prioritize these patients based on clinical urgency. I acknowledge there are multiple unwell patients. So I will therefore first see if I have colleagues to help. It's important to show that you are a team-based uh, junior doctor. Um, very often the scenario will be you're on your own and you need to manage the situation. So you need to move on to say, this might not be possible. I will therefore assess patients one, two, or three first, as maybe they have an airway compromise or a breathing compromise. Then I will assess patients two, three, or four at second, as they are lower down onto the A to E scenario and uh, won't die as quickly as the first patient. It is important to say that whilst you're on your way to see the patient, or whilst you're seeing patient one and later seeing patient two, to say that you would like to involve the multidisciplinary team, such as your nursing colleagues, uh, other junior doctors, to try and see the other patients or the one you're about to see. Ask them to perform a new set of observations, ask them for the drug chart, ask them for the, um, the history of the patient and have a new score ready. So that when you arrive to see the patients, you're not waiting for them to perform an ECG. You'll then say that you'd like to perform an A to E such, um, scenario, running through everything. Um, and you need to ensure that you've rehearsed this uh, until it's out of nature. We will now be moving on to the scenarios. One thing to bear in mind is that after the scenario slide, we have shown you the A to E um, observations for each patient. Just bear in mind that this will not happen in the interview. You'll run through A to E as in your off and they will provide you the information maybe show you the blood results, gas results, and ECG, but we've just shown them to you to make it as easy as possible in the time we have provided. So I'll now hand over to Ollie to go with the first scenario. Cool, um, thank you, Alex. So yeah, just, just to reiterate what Alex has said, we've got four scenarios for you tonight. Um, you'll be given an opening, uh, an opening stem, I guess is the word, isn't it? The beginning of a question. Uh, to give you a rough outline of the scenario and this is really common this is also done in finals often so it's good to know this stuff and on the next slide you'll uh, get an a to e but it won't have it won't have all the information it will have some information uh, because in reality that's often all you get you get some of the information you know maybe the ecg machine's broken or the sats probe is broken or there's no one around all of this stuff um, and uh, not all of it will be useful. It's it's just to help you try and make a clinical decision with with what you have, and that's really what it's about: safe decision making. So, for our first scenario, and, and get ready to type because we'll need your input. You are an FY1 doctor working on the respiratory ward. Gordon, one of the patients, is a seventy three year old man who has previously had very little contact with the health service until a recent admission yesterday with a chest infection. So that's your, your patient. He has just now, as in minutes ago, been switched from oral doxycycline to intravenous coamoxiclav. Um, you are called to review him by one of the ward nurses as his breathing has gotten worse. Okay, so remember your opening spiel. That Alex has, has just gone through when you'd, you'd be explaining what you would do. But here we go. So we should now have an A to E. Yeah, cool. So uh, for the A, we've got some swollen lips and some gasping <laughs> noises. Respiratory rate of 26. Uh, SATs running at 92% on air. Where I've used OA in these scenarios, it means on room air, uh, with with quiet breath sounds when you auscultate his chest. He's tachycardic, 120, with normal cap refill, no radial delay, uh, with a blood pressure of 102 over 64. His temperature is 37.2. He's got blood glucose again. Um, for those unfamiliar, BM is uh, blood glucose. You've got a BM of seven. Uh, pupils equally responsive and reactive to light and accommodating. 
and on further examination has an urticarial rash to the neck and left arm with a soft non-tender abdomen. So based on everything that we've been through, um, what investigations would you like? What do you think might be going on? That's the, these are the questions that will be leveled at you basically in response. What do you think is going on here? Or what information do you need that might help you decide what might be going on? So this is all about differential diagnosis. If you just let us know in the chat as soon as you've got an idea. Mustafa, do you want, can you give us some differential? Yeah, Amanda, you need, but remember, they'll ask you for differentials. Mm. Whilst, yes, we have possibly our diagnosis, but they're going to test you and see if you know your differentials. Mm. How do you know it's not something else is kind of as important a question. Or what makes you think it is that equally? Should we give it another few seconds and then? Okay, yeah. Ishita and um, Amanda have um, written. Amanda's written, get some bloods for inflammation markers and an x-ray to rule out a pneumothorax. Ishita have said that the differentials are possibly penicillin allergy or a pneumonia that's worsening. Yeah, all pretty reasonable. Cool, yeah, so if we... If we move on, so as as you've very astutely noticed, this is indeed anaphylaxis. So uh, for each of the conditions that we're talking about, I think it's really important to remember, you know, everything is about anatomy, physiology and pathophysiology. It's about going back to your, your understanding of what the condition actually is. So anaphylaxis is a life-threatening allergic reaction to a substance. I've put mostly in brackets there because non-allergic anaphylaxis is a thing. Um, but it's most likely when all of the following three conditions are met. Ra rapid onset after exposure to a possible allergen. Um, so we had that medication switch here in, in this case. Life-threatening airway, breathing or circulatory problems. Um, as well as skin mucosal changes. And remember, it's the syndrome, the combination of these three things that makes anaphylaxis what it is. If you, for example, just had the urticarial rash, we wouldn't call that anaphylaxis. We'd, we'd call it an allergic reaction. Um, so it's all about those A, B, and C symptoms, um, which our man here uh, had. Uh, and he has all three of these conditions. So this is one of the simpler um, ALS guidelines to remember, but it's one of the ones that's really well worth knowing. I think, I think, can we just ask the crowd, I what think... is one of the, one of the key treatment options for this? And if you guys don't know this, what are you doing at medical school? <laughs> what is the management? How do you treat anaphylaxis? Give me one word. Yes, exactly. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, yes, Ishita. Yes, that's fair. But yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> We're getting the key points. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So this right here is the anaphylaxis algorithm, and this is straight from uh, ALS. So some of you will do ALS as final year medical students. Some of you will do it when you're F1s. Um, I would hope that you would all do it before your F2s because that seems quite late. Um, so anaphylaxis, the first thing, call for help. This is a life-threatening emergency, um, possible respiratory arrest within, within minutes. Um, remove the offending trigger, which Ishita said, I think, in the chat. So absolutely, if that is a cannula with a 
uh, with something going through it, either stop the the fluid or take the thing out if it is, um, I don't know, a, a metal or something that they might be allergic to. Basically, take away the offending stimulus, whatever it is, because they will they will keep reacting to it, and mast cells will keep degranulating. Um, lie them flat with their legs up. So this is a time when you can use the flatten the bed button uh, that a lot of hospital beds have for arrests where it will literally just drop um, and then get their legs in the air. Because the whole point of this is that you're bringing venous return back to the heart, back to the SVC. Um, if they're pregnant on their left side to avoid compressing the SVC, because that would again stop your venous return. The big treatment, IM adrenaline, intramuscular, 500 micrograms of one in a thousand concentration adrenaline. This will be pre-dosed in your crash cart. Um, so every crash cart should have adrenaline in it. Uh, ALS guidelines, again, middle third of the thigh, the anterolateral uh, aspect of the thigh. Securing the airway, making sure they're getting high flow. That's 15 litres oxygen via non-rebreathe mask. If there is no response within five minutes to that first dose of adrenaline, so you need someone to be timing, uh, so you need a helper, That's you need a second dose of IM adrenaline with an IV fluid challenge, 500 mils of a crystalloid of your choice, something like Hartman's or saline, it doesn't really matter. And then if there is no improvement, this, this is one of the things that's often missed off the end of the algorithm, no improvement in B or C symptoms, so breathing or circulation after two doses, five minutes apart, then that is what's called refractory anaphylaxis. And the way you manage it is with an IV adrenaline infusion. And you are not doing that by yourself. You need senior help. Um, so that's why we call for help early. Yeah, I think if you haven't already called for help, I think by the time you finished, let's say, um, you've secured the airway and given high flow oxygen. Like that's what, what you've spoken about in your management. If you haven't said you would escalate at this, then you should to get the brownie points. Yeah. So this again is one of the things, I don't know what you guys will have been taught um, among the different medical schools, but when I was taught how to manage anaphylaxis it was actually outdated by the time i did my uh, als um so antihistamines and steroids used to be part of the anaphylaxis treatment protocol they no longer are so in the, the most modern version of the guidelines they're not the reason for that is that people were faffing around trying to remember the doses of um the antihistamines and corticosteroids Corticosteroids, as you know, do nothing acutely. They take hours to work. And uh, again, what they found when they studied it was it, it was delaying the administration of adrenaline. And that's the really important thing. So if you've got time, mention them at the end, but not important. And the test that you can think about afterwards is a mast cell tryptase uh, in the serum. This is a substance that's released by mast cells. And if you can, again, three times samples. The first one uh, immediately, so uh, after you've started your recess process, within two hours, not later than four, and then at 24 hours, because that gives you your baseline. So you're, you're proving kind of retrospectively that, that it was uh, an anaphylactoid reaction. Uh, for some, and again, Aqua was mentioning brownie points after care is a really important part of urgent urgent and emergency care. Uh, you don't just leave the patient, you need to take responsibility for them. So with anaphylaxis, that's observation for at least six hours, because if you remember from your first and second year about IgE mediated reactions, there is a biphasic response. Sometimes it kicks in again at about six hours. Uh, your steroids will help with that if they were given. Um, send them home with an EpiPen and referral to a specialist allergy service to try and work out what was going on. And that's yep. your anaphylaxis. Thank you. And I think we're going to have um, Alex to go through our second scenario. Um, 
And I think it's important just to remind you, if you have any questions along the way, please um, type them in the chat. We're monitoring. All right, so now moving on to scenario two. Um, so you are an FY1 doctor normally working the acute medical unit. One of your patients, Julie, is a 26 year old woman has been admitted admitted following a road traffic accident. One of the nurses calls you to see Julie urgently as her breathing has become laborious and she looks unwell. A blue and brown inhaler are visible on her bedside table. When you arrive, Julie's complaining of worsening chest pain. So before we move on, what do we think could be happening to the patients at the moment, given the clinical scenario? What are your top, um, I guess, differential diagnoses again? And just as a sideline advice, when any medical professional tells you a patient looks unwell, that should be kind of red flags because that means they're very concerned about the patients. Okay, so what are our top differentials at the moment? Harris Muhammad, my boy. Um, Harris has said, pneumothorax, hemothorax, tamponade, and Oluwatobi has said flail chest. Mustafa has said asthma, pneumothorax, MI, shock. Very good. So we've got a wide uh, set of differentials here. So we've got traumatic orthopedic injuries, we've got respiratory conditions, we've got cardiovascular conditions. I agree all of them are fitting with the scenario. So now in the actual interview you now start working through a to e so if we go to the next slide so you you know look for danger for a response and it comes up a for airway so we've got a patient who's gasping making gasping noises and breathing the lips appear swollen really yeah now moving on to breathing the respiratory rate is 32 so they're tachypneic saturations are down to 90 percent on room air there's reduced air entry and auscultation on the left side, and the chest is hyper resonance on percussion on the left as well. When I'm assessing the cardiovascular system, I note the patient is tachycardic. Uh, there is a prolonged cap refill time, and the blood pressure is okay, slightly hypertensive. The patient is um, normal temperature, glucose is within normal ranges, slightly on the lower side, and pupils are equal and reactive to light. The patient is complaining of central sharp chest pain and just for complete um, observations, uh, examination, the abdomen and calves are soft and non-tender. So based on our observations and we've requested a chest x-ray as part of this and the interviewers have now shown it to us, what do we think about this chest x-ray? Is there anything glaringly abnormal here? So if any, you know, radiography, radiographic films, you would, you know, assess um, the quality, uh, you know, inspiration, etc. But, you know, in an emergency here, we're just going to look for glaring uh, abnormalities. So Mustafa said we've got a left-sided tension pneumothorax. Okay. Do we have any more? Um, Harris, again, is saying left-sided absence of lung markings with tracheal deviation to the right potentially leaning towards the pneumothorax. Very good. As a conflict of interest, I know Harris from medical school. Okay. Yeah, so here I'm looking at the, the x-ray. Um, slightly concerned on the left side, it looks very empty compared to the right. Um, maybe Aqua can move her mouse to show you that, you know, there is a small blob centrally on the left-hand side that's normally should be up to the ribcage essentially and that's the collapsed lung so for some reason air has entered the lung and got a pneumothorax um as people have correctly pointed out we've got some tracheal deviation um that's shifted everything to the right and you know same with um, any kind of um brain bleeding any central deviation away from the what's normal is very concerning. So I'm concerned here that there is a left-sided tension pneumothorax. So we'll just briefly go over the different types of pneumothoraces you can have. So a simple pneumothorax is gas or air within the um, 
pleural space within the thoracic cavity. So as you know, the pleural space is normally pleural fluid, um, and that helps to maintain the pressures to help inflate and deflate the lungs. The tension pneumothorax is what we call a progressive accumulation of air or gas, um, and that's normally caused by trauma. So stabs, gunshot wounds, road traffic accident we've, we've got here. So any kind of rib fractures um, that are communicating with the skin allows air to enter. And as the patient keeps breathing in and out, essentially we have a flat formation. That means that more and more air is accumulating within. We can also flood the subdivided pneumothoracy space in primary and secondary. And this refers to whether the patient has existing lung conditions or in the absence of it. So primary is, um, if I'm not mistaken, in the absence of existing lung conditions and secondary is with lung disease. So how do we manage an accumulation of air in a space that is quite severe? As mentioned in House of God, um, there is no body cavity that cannot be reached with a 14 gauge needle and a good strong arm. So the go-to management here is to palpate the second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, and essentially put the needle in and you want to decompress the air out. And you should hear a hiss of air as it steadily comes out of the chest. The patient should also report uh, reduced pain on inspiration and resolving uh, respiratory um, complications. I do want to ask, um, does anybody know what color a 14 gauge cannula is? Because I didn't really appreciate the different sizes and the different colors, at least at medical school. Obviously, I know now as a junior doctor, but clearly not at medical school. Mustafa's correct, not, sorry, Harris. I thought that too. Orange is bigger than gray. Yeah, Amanda, yeah, exactly. Crazy, isn't it? Think about how big that is. So if people don't already know, gauge is a system, which me by just a broad example is within a tube or a pipe, how many can we fit inside there? So 14 gauge means within a, you know, a circle, we can fit 14 of these cannulas inside. So it means fewer compared to a 20 gauge cannula, we can fit 20 of them. So if you imagine the lumens of them individually, they're a lot bigger. Um, other thing, just to put it to perspective, if you've not seen an orange or a gray cannula, is your standard blue or pink cannulas. They're quite flexible, the, the metal part of the cannula. A 14 gauge cannula is stiff, it's thick, um, it's very big. So yeah, hopefully I can find one at some point. All right, so just some specific minutiae of um, tension pneumothorax management. The ALS guideline states that if you're going to do needle decompression during CPR, you should either do a open thoracostomy or a chest ring placement, uh, and these are placed differently. So an open thoracostomy is making an incision to directly visualize uh, the, the lung space, and chest ring placement is as, as stated. Um, I presume this is basically because if you're trying to put a cannula in whilst you're doing chest compressions here, uh, that's going to get in the way for one, and two, there's risk of it being dislodged, and etc. Whereas if you put it um, laterally, uh, you're more likely to have a bigger tube that's able to drain the air more effectively as well. Yeah, and now we would like to hand it back to Ollie as we go through um, the third scenario. Does anybody have any questions yet? Otherwise, we can just straightly move into um, Ollie. Just before we move to Ollie, a quick one is tension pneumothorax is a medical emergency. Nothing should delay your management, which also means that as soon as you suspect it, you should not be delaying anything by even getting a chest x ray. You need to manage it there and then, and with no further delay as well, just to remember that. And make sure you mention that you'd escalate and inform the medical registrar. You will lose points if you do not mention that. Just imagining the med reg turning up and saying, you did what without telling me? You put a 14 gauge? You don't even know what a 14 gauge is. You put a gray in? No. Um, it, it's an interesting point Alex raises, actually, and, and we've got a bit of time. So probably it's a reasonable question to ask. 
you know, when I'm going through my A2E, we, we often get asked when doing teaching with the medical students about should I fix things, you know, as they come up in the, in the A2E, you know, if the oxygen sat so low, should I say I would apply oxygen here? Um, my experience with the interviews was that it, it didn't really matter as long as you clarified what you were going to do. If, if you said, I'll do the management after my full examination, or you fix things as you're going through the A2E, um, I think ideally you should be comfortable to do both by that by that point. Um, so your interviewers might want you to do something particular. Just ask them if you're not sure. And again, with things like anaphylaxis, definitely with a tension pneumothorax, you you can either break your sequence and say, okay, just based on what we've already observed, I am happy or I think this is likely to be anaphylaxis. And I don't want to delay giving the adrenaline, you know, you can you can have a bit of a clinical backwards and forwards with your interviewer and see what they want you to do. Um, anyway, let's go into scenario three. But I'm, I'm just adding on to Ollie's point there. Are obviously, for London, for example, it will be dependent on your interviewer. But be mindful that you will only have 10 minutes. Yeah. So your priority is just to get through this quickly. Use the information that you have in front of you, which you will have, like respirate X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. And if they choose to show you X, Y, they, you know, they might not. But you need to work on your most likely diagnosis. And then for extra points, you need to mention your differential diagnoses and then um, explain whatever the most common management is for whatever your top likelihood is. Because then you need to move on to your next patient. And then you need to move on to the ethical scenario, which you will most likely get for London. In other places, they may ask you to do one patient. They might present to you in one because my other deanery, I just had a PE. Um, and it was very much like what Ollie said. I asked them what they would prefer, and they said, just fix stuff as you go on. We will tell you as you progress. So I did A, nothing in A. B, and then found tons and tons of things in B. Asked for, and then move, moving on to C, I got an ECG, and they showed it to me. You know, that's how it was. And that was just one patient. So deanery specific, but make sure you know how to do both. Cool. Okay. So let's, uh, let's crack on with scenario three. So you're an F1 doctor working in the emergency department. This is, as a side note, a rare rotation, but it does happen. You are finishing some documentation work from your previous patient when you're called to see Mick, who is a 52 year old builder who has developed some central chest pain. When you go and see him, he is sweating profusely and vomits into a bowl as you approach his bed. He's clutching his chest and struggling to breathe properly. Does anybody want to give any differential diagnoses before we reveal the ATE just from that history? It's not a calming history, is it? It's quite, <laughs> quite, um, should, should raise some eyebrows. Boar halves? Did you know that the, um, incidence of, uh, boar halves is one in one million? <laughs> wow. It's like I'm on upper GI. Oh, yeah. But not invalid, though. <laughs> very true, very very true. I know, Amanda, I know. But yeah, let's go through the A to E. Yeah, so, um, so he's panting and talking in complete sentences, uh, but struggling to do so. When you get there to speak to Mick, he's got a respirate of 24, his sats are 95% on room air, and you listen to his chest, he's got good air entry throughout, nothing else that you can hear. Heart rate of 98, cap refill of less than 3, no radial delay, and he's hypertensive at 149 over 110. Uh, his temperature is 37. He's got a blood glucose of 11 millimoles per litre, and his pupils are equally responsive uh, and reactive to light. And I say he's, um, I think the medical term is it diaphoresis. He's just 
really like sweating buckets when you go and see him. So what investigations would you like and what do you think might be going on? And we'll, we'll give it about 30 seconds or so. I'm just, I'm wary that we've got another scenario to get through and then to leave some time for questions. Yeah, and what would you want to do um, to help rule out um, ACS? Oh, Harris has said it, yeah. ECG tra troponins as well. What would you want to do if it was a PE? I can't see the chat, Aqua, but if, if, anyone, or if anyone says D-dimer, I want you to kick them from there. I, from call. Okay, no, Oluwa Tovi has said well score. Good. And Mustafa Fine. has CTPA. And Mustafa has also said ECG, chest x ray, bloods, and cardiac enzymes, which is what Harris and Amanda have also said as well. Very good. <laughs> anyone who says. No virtual kicking. Yeah. If anyone says D dimer before well score, <laughs> okay. Your consultant will be very angry, as were your med reg. I feel like he's talking from experience here. But anyway. So um, lots of you have very correctly identified that this is most likely to be an acute coronary syndrome of some sort. Um, because, again, if you said, for example, I think this is a STEMI specifically, just based on the information you had, um, you might get a raised eyebrow because you can't know that definitively without more information. So uh, we've got a, a little sort of aid memoir here. Uh, this is like the simplest barn door way of trying to classify the acute coronary syndromes of which there are three. The first and the simplest one, if there is ST elevation on an ECG in combination with cardiac chest pain, and I'm being very careful about those words, then that's the STEMI by definition, ST elevated myocardial infarction. If you have no ST elevation, or ST depression or T wave inversion, other changes. Um, with negative troponins, which you do sequentially, so you have two negative results, that's your unstable angina diagnosis. If you get positive troponins and therefore cardiac mycite damage, that is your N STEMI, a non ST elevation myocardial infarction. So, yeah. This is, uh, again, it's important to think about definitions for the conditions that you're diagnosing. Uh, to have ST elevation in your myocardial infarction, you've got to have a transmural infarct. That is complete um, occlusion of the blood vessel by a thrombus. Uh, and that produces localized ST elevation in the territory that that coronary vessel supplies. Um, in turn, you get cardiac myocyte death resulting from malperfusion, and that causes your troponin uh, release. Most labs will test for troponin T or troponin I. Um, it depends on your particular lab. I think there is an ECG on the next slide. I'm hoping. Uh, this is just a quick one, because again, you might be asked to do it. Uh, if I told you that this was a STEMI, which territory, uh, if you were to try and describe where the location of the thrombus is, just looking at this, would you be able to tell uh, in the chat if you post your ideas? It might be a while since <laughs> some people have looked at an ECG. I don't even look at like I just look at an ECG and I'm like, hmm, yeah. Yep, that's, that's the thing. Oh, AF? Mm. He, he's known AF, right? Yeah, he's known AF. Okay. Hmm, squiggles. Hmm. Or oh, let's, I think, maybe easier. Which leads show ST elevation? Yeah, that's, that's a good place to start.
Fraser has said anterior. Any advancements on that? Ooh, Oluwatobi has said anteroceptal. I think I mean, just to just to, to make sure we move on. I think both of those answers would be um, would be absolutely more than fair. Uh, your um, septal leads there being, well, technically speaking, V one and V two, and your and your purely anterior leads um, three and four. So yeah, I th absolutely either of those would be fine. Well done. So uh, to run very quickly through the STEMI algorithm, and again, uh, all of these videos are available on demand, both on the MEDOL website, uh, so we'll make sure that they're all available, and on my YouTube channel as well, uh, it will be from tonight, but suspected STEMI, uh, or confirmed STEMI, once you've got your ECG, 300 milligrams of aspirin to load them up, then this is the key question, is this person going to be suitable for cardiac reperfusion therapy? If it's within 12 hours of symptom onset and you can get them to cath lab within two hours, uh, they need angiography with primary PCI. So that's going to be your um, clot removal, clot busting and stenting, for which they would get prasagrel uh, with aspirin. I mean, this, this is all ALS. Your local cath lab may have different guidelines. If it's within 12 hours of symptom onset and you can't get them to a cath lab within two hours, then you're instead going to fibrinolyze, uh, basically break down the clot and uh, it's ticagrelor with aspirin, which is commonly used for that. If you, uh, if the above basically isn't true, so it's beyond that symptom onset, uh, then you're going to medically manage them. Uh, the standard for that again in the UK is ticagrelor with aspirin. Um, so ticagrelor is an antiplatelet similar to aspirin. Uh, if it's if, if they've got a low bleeding risk, for example, if they're not warfarinized or something like that, or on, on a DOAC, uh, clopidogrel instead of ticagrelor if high. And then cardiac secondary prevention, you will all have heard a million times, ACE inhibitor, DAP to dual antiplatelet therapy, beta blocker, uh, statin. And again, thinking about aftercare, cardiac rehabilitation, lifestyle change, education, screening for heart failure with echoes all of that kind of thing, be bread and butter to you. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, save them for the end, because I'd like to quickly whiz through the last scenario, which is quite fitting because of my rotation that I'm currently on. So you're on FY1, working in Gen Surge. You've just started your evening on call and you walk into a bay just as a patient pro projectile vomits a large volume of fresh blood onto the opposite wall. And I have seen this, it is very, very graphic. He is a 64 year old male who had uncomplicated laparoscopic appendectomy three days ago, and he's currently receiving no anticoagulant medications. Does anybody wanna hazard a guess what's happening? Anybody, anybody want to give any differentials? This man is projectile bleeding, well, vomiting blood. Okay, Mustafa, yep. Anyone else? Or should I say, if we know that this is an upper GI bleed, can anybody tell me the most common causes for an upper GI bleed? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Esophageal varices, um, peptic ulcer disease. Anything else? Give me one more. That kind of links with peptic ulcer. This is mean because I really didn't know know this until I saw it on my rotation. Esophagitis cancer. Yeah, but you wouldn't get projectile. 
So essentially, um, the most common causes are esophageal varices, peptic ulcers, gastric erosions. And um, we'll go through a bit more about the pathophysiology after we do our ATE. But moving on to our ATE primary assessment, blah, blah, blah. The patient you see is retching. That's pretty much the assessment for his airway. His respirate is 24, so it's quite raised. Sats have dropped a bit to 94. He's got good air entry throughout, but we do hear some crackles in the right base. His heart rate is, obviously, he's tachycardic. His cap refill time is fine. And as you can see, he's very, very low with his blood pressure. And his pulse is quite thready. His temperature has now been elevated. Normal other things. Looking at him systematically, I guess, no rash. And you know that he's vomiting blood. And that's all in keeping with an upper GI bleed. So moving on, as we've already identified, these are the most common causes. And there are three key factors. Does anybody want to tell me clinically what are some dead giveaways or associations with an upper GI bleed? Or what will we see on assessment as well, potentially? First one is age related. Which patient population in terms of age group will you see this more likely in? Over 50, close, yep. Yeah. And um, in terms of their stools for the second one, what color do you think it might be? If it's really bad. Yeah, exactly. It'll be black. And related to that, does anybody know anything about uh, like a creatinine ratio? Something to do with like the urea and creatinine, all because of blood obviously being digested, di digested and stuff. Yeah, exactly. You're going to get an increased ure urea creatinine ratio to push you some more, Harris. Can you tell me why? you get an increased ratio? I kind of alluded to it earlier. Yeah, yeah, pretty much exactly that. Like it's being broken down and increased. Yeah, exactly. Increased, you know, the nitrogen waste products or urea. And with two or more of these, you're gonna you're gonna think that an upper GI is more likely. However, you can see this guy is literally coughing up and vomiting out blood. So this is the algorithm again from the ALS protocol. Um in terms of scores, hope well, now you've seen this, you've seen the slide already, but does anybody want to tell me which score you're going to use first and why and what it actually looks at? Hopefully you didn't look at the slide for too long. Yeah, oh, that's how you remember, that's so nice. But why, why do you do that score first? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well done. Yeah, amazing. Okay. And then what's the second score then? It's not rock wool. Close. It sounds very similar. Yes, you have. The only reason why I know is because he's also he, the same guy who's made who made that score is a professor at my um, hospital, 
and I literally walk past his office every day. So he would literally kill me if I got it wrong. Yes, Rockle. It's the Rockle school. Exactly. And what does that measure? Or look at? Close, it's looking at like um, the risk of death, morbidity, mortality, all of the post. Yeah, exactly. All of the post stuff. So one is pre endoscopy, one is post endoscopy. So, first step, we're going to do the bachelor's school, risk assessment, need things raised, you're going to want to do it. If you suspect a varicel bleed, and in these patients with liver disease and alcohol excess, you're going to give them terlipressin. Obviously, with this chap, we know that his blood pressure dropped and he was very tachycardic. And if we were to look at his HB, we, it probably will, like in a couple of hours, it may be, may be dropped because obviously it takes a, a little bit of a while for it to reflect in the, in the bloods. But you would transfuse if necessary. If, again, same, same goes with platelet and fresh frozen plasma. In terms of endoscopy, we can split this. If you, we know that the patient is severely, severely bleeding and he's unstable, his new score is off the charts, immediately, done, dusted, C-pod, your C-pod theatre is going to be open and willing to take this patient. Then we need to make sure it's within 24 hours for everyone else. However, in your interview, and maybe OSCE, you're most likely going to get a really unwell patient and this is going to take your top priority. If it's variceal, you need to start talking about and showing off your knowledge. And again, these slides will be made for you, uh, made available for you on Ollie's YouTube channel, and we will put it all on metal. Band ligation tips. If they're gastric, again, N NBCA or tips. If non variceal, again, we can give mechanical or thermal anticoag, fibrin, thrombin. You can literally just split it into variceal or non variceal. These patients need to be on PPI or H2 receptor antagonists. And again, in terms of aftercare, you need to spit this out. You need to be able to roll this off your tongue. Low dose aspirin, you're gonna make sure that they're not on any NSAIDs because they irritate the stomach, obviously. And then you're gonna want some specialist input um, if they have chronic diseases, for example, liver or alcohol problems. And you're gonna to want to do the Rockle school. This is just things that you need to absolutely memorize. And this will also be in the back of the Oxford um, handbook. There is a chapter on emergencies that I would heavily advise you reading it and you read it until you literally get sick of it and you memorize the positions of each word on each page. That is how, how chronic you need to just absolutely absorb it, okay? You need to be obsessed. As, as we rightfully pointed out, Ratchford first, then Rockle. I'm gonna hand it back on to Ollie and Alex for their concluding sentences, I guess. Uh, sure, I'll, um, th this is just something I put at the end. I'm sure Alex has something more erudite to say, but um, this stuff, although a lot of it feels very academic and you, know, and you guys are here on a Thursday night probably sick and tired of thinking about medicine um, and stressing about the AFP, sorry, SFP applications. This is actually, I think, the part of the process that is useful and is a good use of your time um, because all of this stuff is finals level. Ultimately, it's very fair game for your written papers and your clinical exams. And most importantly, like this is the practice of medicine this is going to be really relevant for you guys when you become F1s and when you're an SHO on call. The reason they're called common emergencies is that they happen commonly. And because junior doctors live on the wards rather than elsewhere, you're going to be first on scene a lot of the time, um, especially once you've done your ALS, you, you could in theory be leading an arrest. So um, Kind of, it's worth knowing. That's the first thing, and the second thing: know the broad strokes and the general flow, rather than if you've got a limited amount of memory space, 
it's knowing the big important steps rather than being able to say, well, I know that if it's a gastric variceal bleed, then I need to give NBCA, then maybe do a TIPS. That's less important than saying transfuse the patient that is bleeding profusely. Um, so big picture is better than minutiae. Yeah, I completely agree with what Oli has said. The, the underlying emphasis of the SFP clinical interview is for you to be a safe, competent doctor. So the emphasis is for you to be above average at this point of your interview because they need to know that you're good enough with one few rotation to be managing uh, unwell patients and know when to escalate. That is also very important. So don't, don't forget that even though we've gone through A to E at some point, uh, preferably early on, you need to be calling for help because you need to a show that you're a um, team-based doctor able to work with all of your colleagues, and secondly, know when your competencies limits have been reached. So, as a first a junior doctor, first rotation, first night shift, upper GI bleed, probably not going to manage that on your own. So, make sure you call for help. Yeah, and I guess. Um... As a recap, let's just quickly recap everything that we've, you know, retouched on. So we've spoken about how for your clinical portion of your interview, um, you're going to have a couple of unwell patients if you're London, or in other deaneries, you'll be given our scenario. And remember that you can be given an unwell patient, a patient who is about to deteriorate, or an ethical dilemma. And remember, Prioritize A over B and C over D, for example. Consider the clinical trends. And make sure you have this memorized. Like this can basically, this is at least 20 to 30 seconds that you can secure in the bag. This will make you look so professional that, hell, they might even stop listening after the 20 to 30 seconds because they'll be like, oh, okay, this person clearly knows what they're doing or saying. And... We then went through four common scenarios um, and when it comes to next week we're going to go through the four other common scenarios and hopefully throw in some ethical dilemmas which i feel like will be very very worthwhile your time that unfortunately brings me to beg you for your feedback if you guys can yeah it makes a difference guys um you know and when when you are doctors yourselves um hopefully doing similar sessions on supporting people into the SFP, which I'm sure that lots of you will, uh, you will want it as well. <laughs> so it, it pays forwards. Um, you will, you will, we all need it at some point. But Yeah, and your feedback directly helps to improve the session. So I think very early on, everyone likes the interactive nature, so continue that as a key theme. And after next week's session, at the end of that, we'd like to hopefully run a mock scenario. So a couple of scenarios, how do you prioritize and how do you work through those once we've covered a couple more uh, A to E scenarios as well. Yeah. And please, please ask any questions that you have. We'll, we'll be around um, just for a few more minutes uh, to, to try and tie up any loose ends. We've got some more questions, um, Ollie. So L H that's how you pronounce your name, right? Totally not a fake name. Um, are these lectures available on YouTube too? Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, some people wrote to me saying that they were having some problems accessing the on-demand videos on Medall. Uh, it's because we haven't put them up. So we've got only got the ones up for the first two, but the, so we need to upload them basically. Yeah, we'll put them on, um, but yeah. they are all, yeah, on, on the YouTube channel as well. And this one will be up. And in terms of YouTube, just type in Ollie Burton Med and it, it should show up. Yeah. And then um, JJ has asked, sorry for a final question, is the clinical station for Northern similar to London? Um, it's a good question. Unfortunately, not, not one that I'm able to answer particularly. Um, just as, as I say to everyone, like virtually everyone that is applying to Northern asks me about the interview the safest thing for me, uh, especially as someone, so the um, pro Professor Vance who runs the Northern program is my supervisor. Um, and so I have quite a lot of insight into how 
how the process works. I, I just have a flat kind of, I do my best not to discuss the Northern interview with people because it would, it, it would be a little bit unfair. So have, have a look at what they publish on the website and that that's kind of all of the information I can give, I'm afraid. Um, that's very fair. And the only reason why me and Alex kind of feel free about the two to three patient scenario thing is because that's widely known. And if you look up on the London um, website, you'll see and they usually give examples. So make sure you check that for if you're um, applying to London. And JJ, I guess as a rule of thumb, just practice both. Practice every single type of A to E, um, whether that's treating as you go along or doing your assessment first and then talking about your management, then going into your different tools and why you think it is, um, or and then practice two to three rapidly going through it within like 10 minutes or expanding on everything um, for 10 minutes for one patient. Yeah, I completely agree. So practice is the key to SFP, practicing with friends, getting, you know, actual doctors do mock interviews because coming off slick, competent is probably the most important thing you can do. Uh, and especially for the clinical scenarios, managing all of the patients given to you is quite important. So Key advice is when you get the scenario, you'll have a few minutes, I can't remember how many minutes you get to prepare. Start thinking about, you know, who's the most unwell patient and your prioritization. So if you're given, you know, a chest pain patient and a patient that's angry and you prioritize the angry patient first, you're probably going to fail the interview. Um, and that's quite easy to, you know, get confused under pressure. So do take a minute to think about it. Um, and also, you know, whilst you're going to see the first patient, you may not have enough time at the end of the interview to come back to see your second patient. Start having your safety net in place. Can you send one of the nurses or one of your colleagues to go, you know, hypoglycemic patient? Can they start giving glucogel or a glucose whilst you go manage them, uh, the other patient? Uh, angry patients, can you get someone to, you know, try and speak to them whilst you're away and not leaving them just waiting around the ward? Can you call security, for instance? Uh, so coming off slick and managing all your patients is important. Uh, and don't be surprised. Uh, last year in my London interview, I managed to uh, quite efficiently manage my patients. Uh, we wrapped, finished a bit early, but actually threw in a new scenario. There's another patient who has this condition. How do you manage it? So, Are you joking? Uh, no wonder yeah. the job is yours. Shut uh, up, Alex. Yeah, so just be aware, you know, it's up to the interviewers how far they push you. They, they may just stick to what's given to you. They may push you further, so just be aware anything's possible. Um, yeah. And then Harris has asked, is there a prioritizing, priori bleh, prioritization in every interview? So no. Um, some deaneries will basically ask you one uh, patient scenario, but they'll be very acutely unwell. We know that London and some other deaneries will, however, ask you and, and present to you a couple of patients. I'm not going to go into depth with which other deaneries other than London, but there are a few. And all of this kind of makes the assumption that historical trends follow, because you've, you've got to remember that SFP, like recruitment processes, will be subject to review every year internally in the in the um, the different deaneries and they, they may decide to just completely change it one year and you don't know that you know this year is isn't going to be the year where they do that so it it's um as i think we've all said before it's better to know your stuff and be very well practiced rather than relying on kind of practicing for a particular set of scenarios and questions and then getting something outside of that that throws you. It's about being comfortable while under pressure that's going to be more helpful. Yeah, so, you know, if you go to lots of different courses, lots of different courses will give you a different list of what are the most common ACE scenarios. Just remember that in the SFE, they want to test, you know, the most common the most important what's going to kill a patient type of scenario so you know are you going to be asked how to manage Cushing's emergency possibly but it's probably not the most likely compared to upper GI feed a patient who's resting on the ward um 
those are things they want the most um you know the average junior doctor will need to manage um going back to the question about how to prioritize i'm sure there are lots of different ways to prioritize you can risk stratifies risk stratification patients you can new score them you know prioritize based on the new score you can prioritize based on a to e so it really is up to you but a to e is quite a straightforward quick and easy one so a patient at risk of airway compromise, I'd probably go to see first compared to a patient who is, uh, you know, hypoglycemic or has a low blood pressure, because someone who rests on the ward due to airway compromise will die first compared to someone who has low blood pressure. They've still got a blood pressure. They may deteriorate, but you've got a bit more time to manage that compared to the anaphylaxis patient, for instance. Yeah, and I would just like to add um, two useful tips make sure you refresh and review the deanery specific website because that is where all of your information will be like i know and it's annoying because some of these deaneries might hide links in weird spaces that you need to just figure out by yourself um but london for example gives very very clear guidance if they haven't already uploaded the applicant guide for this year um, and another tip that you can do is there is no harm in you contacting the deanery itself and then you'll be referred to the academic unit and they will decide how much they can disclose to you as an applicant like that is probably your best shot of knowing and getting ahead because th they are the ones that can give you all the correct information and up to date we're giving you not generic we're giving you like i guess the informed information um and the different scenarios but deanery, deanery specific, I would contact them yourselves. Okay, if if nobody has any further questions, and thank you all for coming, um, should we think about drawing it to a close? Yeah, do you guys have any um, further questions? And do come next week as well and do fill in the feedback because next week we are going to go through some more scenarios and um, really, really keen on going through the, the ethical stuff, like the angry patient and then dolls and like how do you assess capacity, all of that stuff and how to do it succinctly in within like your 10 minute time frame or actually two minutes because that's going to be your least prioritized patient, I guess. I'm going to send the link once more and we're going to draw it to a close. Yeah, we're just kind of training you to be F1s at this point. <laughs> it's less about the less about the interview and more about how to be a doctor. We're really traumatized. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. We will see you same place, same time next Thursday here on Metal. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.